Good afternoon, everyone. Muy buenas tardes. I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you who are joining us virtually as well. At CHCI, we pride ourselves on hosting conversations and dialogue around some of the most important issues facing the nation and the Latino community. Today is no different. This fireside chat on nurturing a culture of diversity on Capitol Hill is a space to talk about how we can work to make the public sector workplace more inclusive and increase representation from those who have traditionally been left out of decision making. Based on a recent report by the U.S. House Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Latinos are nearly 20% of the U.S. population, but only 13.5% of all staff in the House of Representatives. And according to the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, people of color account for 40% of the U.S. population, but only 18% of top House staff and only 7.4% of all congressional offices are led by chiefs of staff of color. So today we're gonna to have a conversation about how we can change that and what each of our individual roles might be, but also how we maintain wellness and balance as we do that. We have three distinguished speakers to lead this conversation. Our moderator is a CHCI alumna herself. Noralisa Leo is the Executive Director of Representative Democracy, an organization that collectively builds a future where the government is led by people that reflect and represent America's diversity and drive thoughtful policies to better meet the needs of the people they serve. And she'll be joined by two distinguished panelists. Michelle Maldonado is founder and CEO of Lucencia, a firm dedicated to human flourishing and mindful business transformation. She is an internationally certified mindfulness and emotional intelligence teacher and practitioner with the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute and the International Mindfulness Teachers Association, as well as Genos International and Goldman EI. And finally, my good friend and colleague, Madeline Mielka, a nationally recognized civil rights leader and member of USA Today's inaugural Leaders of Change. As president and CEO of our peer organization, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, or APAX, and founder and principal of Aram Group, LLC, she brings nearly 25 years of experience working in political campaigns and specializes in political and nonprofit fundraising and political training. And with that, let me turn it over to our good friend, Noralisa. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. As Marco mentioned, I am an alum, and it's always, uh, it's always so great to see the next classes coming up. And as I read your profiles and I hear all the things you're doing, I really wonder if I had any chance of getting in today. Um, but it's really testament to just the breath and, and the impressive resumes that, that all of you bring to the table. So just really excited to be here. Um, and to talk about this topic, so as Marco mentioned, Representative Democracy started in 2019, and it was made up of some civil rights groups that you all are very familiar with in working to, to increase diversity in, on Capitol Hill through leadership development programs. And there was such a need, and there were a lot of things that happened back then in 2019, and that we expanded the footprint to now do work with cities and states and uh, bring those resources to other forms of government. And there are two approaches to this. One, one, one really looks at building new systems, like that long-term changing the system. I'm sure everybody in this room, have you ever felt like a square peg trying to fit into the office and you, you're different? Um, so that's what we call the systems bill, like let's change the system so that it makes room for us and we're not forcing ourselves in it. That's really tough work and it takes a long time, but we're committed to it. For the now, the right now, we continue to support leadership development programs and strategies for, for you, for staff. And although we work with elected officials and community groups, we really do uh, place a huge emphasis on staff. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about, given that you are all on the Hill, uh, and, and send a couple of messages. Because we do, we recognize this job is hard. In today's world, the post-January 6th, the divisiveness that is in this country, public service is hard. P 
put that on top of that feeling of alienation, of being the only one in the room, of being the first in so many ways, um, it's a lot to deal with, and we understand that. Um, and so I really want to underscore that in the work that we do and the people that, the different organizations we work with, we see you, we appreciate everything that you're doing. And if there's anything I wanna say to y'all today, and when you hear Michelle and Madeline speak uh, throughout their remarks and responses, is that there is a whole system rooting for you. Even when you feel alone, there's a whole system of organizations, of uh, you know, civil rights groups and community-led efforts because we do understand what you're doing matters and it's important. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is talk a little bit more about some of those strategies that can help in the workplace, um, resources, mental health resources, and places where you can go to, to um, you know, help make things a little easier. I'd also like to say that in, despite of, in spite of those challenges, you are also in a very powerful position. And so I also, and we'll talk a little bit at the, conclu the conclusion of, of this program, but you are in a position to, to help and lift others with you. And so I think that as we speak today, I, I'll also leave you with a call of action in how you can go and sort of lead that movement and, and the way that you can help others in the same situation. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started and I'm gonna have to read some of these questions. We will start with Michelle over here on my left. Um, let me ask the question, here we go. <laughs> so public service is a very demanding job, as you know. It's even more challenging for people of color. In light of today's polarization and what happened on January 6th, how important is mental health and supporting staff, staff well-being? I think if we had a scale of one to 10, it wouldn't be a 10. It'd be in a million and 10, right? This is something that we haven't really talked about a lot. There's been a stigma around mental health and the need for it. And it's across all kinds of industries. You know, after uh, January 6th happened, I work with Naleo bringing some uh, programs here and make, opening it up to staffers. To how do we help bridge? How do we help process this? How do we help heal from this? Um, so what I would say is that uh, there is no more important action than to invest in yourself, to be able to create the conditions for healthy mental well-being, physical well-being. And it's not an easy thing to do because we are not told in these environments, in these ecosystems, to take care of ourselves. We're actually programmed to give, to be givers, to give to depletion, to give to exhaustion. And the problem with that is that we end up working on fumes. Anybody ever feel like you're working on fumes? Yeah, I see lots of heads nodding. Because this is, this is our reality. When we are servant-minded, we tend to continue to give until we are burnt out. So um, the COVID, uh, sort of the isolation from that, January 6th, and then things that kind of happened after that, it has really brought this to a crescendo. So we need to take action to care for ourselves. The first place to start is to uh, give yourself permission that it's okay not to feel okay, and to give yourself permission to seek resources and time to care for yourself. Now everybody's always gonna say, but I don't have enough time, I've gotta get this done and I'm already behind. And I will tell you when you sort of practice that self-care, you start to be able to create pockets and energies where you can kind of surge and focus. And uh, there are a number of places around town that you can kind of go to, whether that's out in nature. I mean, we're in DC, but we've got some amazing national parks that can uh, be places to replenish too, if you're not looking for an organization or a group but there are, there are many ways. So I'm gonna pause there because I know we have other people to add to this, but I think it's one of the things that we overlook a lot, that we have to start investing in ourselves. Okay, Madeline. So in Washington, there's a whole score of leadership development programs and as staffers and everybody in the room here can attest, it's really hard to find the time to, to, to participate. What advice would you give to help prioritize and you know somebody who's on the hill, um, what should we be looking for? Well, thank you for that question and also thank you to uh, CHCI for 
um, having me here tonight, and uh, I'm really honored to be on this panel with um, the other speakers. Uh, to your question, I think it's important to understand your why. And that usually helps to really identify how you align with the organizations or the communities that you build um, to be able to provide you that uh, kitchen cabinet for yourself. And so I always encourage uh, the APAX interns and fellows to reach out to the alumni groups. We've also um, connect them with people who have a little bit more seniority in uh, life experience to be able to give them a variety of different pathways to success. Um, and that in itself will also teach them, you know, how they could model themselves. Uh, you know, we have uh, parents, we have people who are single parents, we have people who are working, um, you know, multiple challenges in their own lives that they have uh, sort of gone through various seasons. And so I think that's also important for people to see that it's um, an integration of your personal alignment of values and the values that you might find in the workplace. And so those types of things are what I would encourage people to really think about as they continue on in their path uh, because as you change in the seasons of life, your priorities will also, will also change. Whether that means you stay in DC, whether it means you go home, um, whether or not you are caregiving for your own parents or elderly, all of those are challenges that you may not think about right now as you begin your career, but those moments when you see people who you admire who have these certain challenges now, as I always say, even though you might become more senior in your life in, in terms of your professional development, it doesn't mean it gets easier. And so you have to always find communities and people who are going through similar situations um, to be able to give yourself an opportunity to see how you might be able to na navigate the, the system itself. All right, I'm gonna direct a question to the two of you <laughs> um, and start a lot. Does everybody here work on the Hill? Is everybody placed here in the Hill? Okay. Um, so one of, the, one of the quirks about our United States Congress is there is no HR. So that really creates an interesting workplace situation. Um, and a lot of us have been put in positions where we become the diversity officers. Um, you know, again, going back to the systems change work, we hope to move to a place where that's no longer necessary. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask our panelists, what advice would you give people in the room um, to begin a conversation about workplace inclusion in, uh, in an office? Thank you for that question. I love that question because a lot of times we can feel like the problem is bigger than we can even have the power to influence. And that's one of the biggest myths we believe we sort of fall into. And there's always something we can do. Um, I also serve at the state level in legislature. And what I will tell you is that this is a, this is a challenge across multiple levels. So a couple of things that are important for us to think about doing is asking first the question, who is in the room and who's not in the room? And sometimes that second question is actually more important than the first one. Because that reflects whose voice is being heard and who is not being heard and how do we begin to even tackle the issues around disparate impact or unintended consequences if we don't have that diversity of thought in the room. So when we think about those things, the next thing to do, I mean, I know on the House side, you have the House of, um, you have the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We don't have a, a companion side, uh, or office on the Senate side, but there are places, so that can be a good place to start to think about, let me go and see what there is. Let me see what there is so I can figure out what else is needed. And, and you can look around the room and see not only are each of you allies and champions for one another, but then kind of spiraling up, identifying people in this ecosystem who also care. Not everybody's gonna have the time. So sometimes they say, it was your idea, it's yours, right? <laughs> and so be careful about that as you manage your time. But um, identify people who can not only be allies, but are also willing to be champions. Allies don't stand in the way, they can speak up, but champions work for you. Right? They are putting themselves out there. They're creating things in ways that an ally may or may not be able to do. And sometimes that's, the, that's a, a very nuanced difference. So um, starting with what is there, asking who's in the room, who's not in the room to identify some gaps, and then identify people who can be allies and champions uh, so that you can begin to co-create the process and the conditions together going forward. 
this is one of the reasons why I enjoy our partnership also with CHCI and our um, other peer organization, CBCF, because we think it's so valuable for us to work together in coalition. Um, we also find it so important for our program participants to also see one another. You know, we, uh, this past summer, we were able to put um, all of our interns in the same housing um, as uh, CHCI. Um, upcoming uh, programs we have, we'll be putting our um, participants in housing close by to CBCF. Because I always feel that uh, oftentimes, you know, one of the model minority myths that we have with the Asian American community specifically um, is that we always excel. And that's not the case. And so when we have the ability to use our privilege in positions uh, where oftentimes people might put us as a part of the white community and not as a community of color, we want to be able to step into that privilege and use that to help support our allies and other communities of color. And so just going back also to amplify Michelle's words, it's so important to recognize when other people are not in the room. And so that's part of the work that we do at APEX. We do a lot of um, alignment work with our other communities of color to highlight um, why it's so important to see uh, not only Asian Americans, but our, our counterparts and other communities of color and constituencies um, to see the value by having all of us in the room. Um, and so when you're in your own workplace, being able to recognize that and also being able to say to other offices also who might have, uh, again, an, another modeling system that you might find appropriately um, you know, aligned with your own, is how are you able to have these conversations? What's the process in that office that allows to see um, that sort of reflective representation? Um, I've worked with Senate offices that have said, we want our offices to look like our state. And so we need your help to make sure that we have Asian Americans in this office and in positions that aren't just in the entry level um, areas. And so I think that is also important is to understand what does your leadership look like and how can you help them by providing them with resources and information of where they can find um, a more representative uh, value for, for their offices. Um, I'm gonna make a shameless plug for <laughs> representative democracy because as we talk about these issues, this is a lot. And again, it, it shouldn't fall to you, but there is an opportunity here. And so I encourage you that if these conversations are happening in your offices, particularly now that we have a whole slew of, of new folks coming in, on the representative democracy webpage under ideas, uh, we actually have a congressional guide that was created by Laura Maristani, who's here, and Maria Meyer. Some of you may remember Maria. And it is a guidebook on how to build diversity in congressional offices. It's, I would call it like that low-hanging fruit. We all understand the, the challenges in these offices, but there's some really good information that, that Michelle hits on and that Madeline hits on, and just like step by step. So if you have a chance, definitely check it out. Um, and to Madeline's point, I think you've just, this collaboration, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, again, in encourage you if you have questions afterwards to dig deeper into this topic, but we're gonna talk a little bit about collaboration and, and what that looks like. So my first question, Michelle. No, Madeline, <laughs> I've been going this way. <laughs> so many of your alumni, of Apex alumni, go back to the States. Um, what recommendations would you make to ensure connection between Hill staffers and those who go back to the state and more pointedly, how can this help to build these pipelines of diverse public servants in state legislatures and governments? So we have alumni who have gone back home, they've run for office, they've uh, won their elected office positions, um, and we ask them to be mentors. We ask them um, to uh, guide the current class, other classes help us in the selection process of, uh, of the fellows or interns who are, uh, who are coming through um, the program. And for us, that's important because we want to continue relationships in the states because it's also an opportunity for us to um, recruit and identify talent. Um, and so to me, this is an opportunity for, um, for the Asian American community to really find um, that community, um, both in the Beltway and outside. 
because a lot of times when you have federal legislative experience, you can transfer that, translate that into um, how does that affect um, state and local offices. Um, so we have a, a former fellow who is now the chief of staff for a top 100 mayor. Um, and so that's a part of the work that we're seeing is this uh, growth of senior leadership um, in roles that they might not have here um, on the congressional level because I feel like there's oftentimes ceilings that are uh, placed upon uh, the congressional staff. And so it's an opportunity for these alumni to now go into places where they can be senior leaders and be able to help craft public policy um, on that state and local level. So all of that work is really just to build um, a broader network and again, instituting uh, values within um, the alumni to say, please continue uh, the ideals that we have, which is about collaboration, which is working with other communities, being able to um, recognize marginalized communities and giving them the opportunity and the platform to have a voice. And so um, the work that we do is really just beginning in that because uh, although we will be 29 years old next year, it is still very much um, you know, a growing system that we're trying to build. And building that uh, type of um, you know, mentality to say, go home, continue what we're trying to do here in DC um, is something that we're trying to encourage. Thank you. So um, Michelle, you just finished your first legislative session. Thank you for your service. Um, if you could create a wish list for federal allyship and given everybody who is here in the room, um, what would you ask from everyone to support DEIB in the Virginia State Legislature? And what would that look like? That is such a big question. <laughs> and and um, what I love about wish lists is that they are unbounded and they are aspirational in many ways, just like we have at the federal level. And what I would say is that a lot of the issues and challenges that you see at the federal level, we also experience at the state level. And, um, but I will say that uh, the county parts that I represent, I'm, um, I represent part of Prince William County, it is the most diverse uh, county in Virginia and 10th in the nation. And I also represent a city that's next to a sister city where it's majority minority. And so what I will say is that we have to think about, when we start thinking about, well, who's around me? How do I start to create DEIB opportunities, messaging, communications, toolkits for people? Um, it starts with thinking about where you are today. And I say that to people in the Virginia State Legislature. How are we, how are we doing? How are we doing when we're trying, when we're looking for legislative aides, when we're looking for chiefs of staff, when we're like, how, what does our team look like? And because we don't really have HR in the way that traditional organizations have HR, it can be a little challenging. So it's really left to a lot of us. I would love to see formal HR uh, organizations across all of these government levels. Um, I do, I'm a big believer in uh, taking some of the best of what the private sector has to offer and finding ways to mold them to be able to facilitate and support uh, and um, inspire the best of what we can do in the, in the private sector. So um, at minimum, we need, if we can't have all of that in place that looks at um, how are we creating inclusive policy legislation? Uh, I think when those things happen, you start to create law differently. You start to um, discuss and explore disparate impact and unintended consequences earlier on in the process, rather than singularly focusing on a problem and then trying to solve that problem and having these things kind of spill out in unexpected. So um, another thing I think that would be really exciting, I don't know if it happens now, but I would love to see the folks that we bring in at the state level, that they have some time there and it naturally rolls into a federal level experience. So it, if it were like two weeks at state, then it's two weeks at federal, that it's all one program, but the time is split to have exposure and opportunity. And I also think we have, an, we have a responsibility to bring people with us. And a lot of people think, but I, I don't have a title yet, or I don't have this yet, doesn't matter. Wherever you are, in whatever capacity, we always have to be thinking about who can I bring with me? Who can I share this opportunity or information with? Who can I share what I've learned? Because what will invariably happen 
is that somebody will see you, they'll see themselves in you, and it will motivate them to be curious, to take action, to join in. And when they do, when there's a yes, we ought to be on the other side of that with a handout to be able to bring them in. So um, I think that we should be looking across our houses, our general assemblies at the state level, looking to see where we need more representation. And if we're finding that there isn't enough, then I think that all of us have the responsibility. We can work with lots of organizations. There's Emerge, there's Sorensen Institute, there's a whole bunch of organizations that cultivate and prepare people to run. Those relationships need to also be part of the pipeline that feeds into um, our DEIB efforts at the state level too. And, um, and if we can map that to federal, that would be incredibly amazing. Um, I was just, uh, I'll just say this real quickly, I was just at a, um, uh, in September, um, um, a gathering with the Congressional Black Caucus Institute and um, state legislators of color, and that was federal and state coming together. We need to do more of that too. So because of that, then that can help influence what we do at each of the levels and how we're being more inclusive. And I, wanna, I want to add, um, who in this room has served in state legislatures or worked for the state? Anybody? See some folks? It's not easy. <laughs> I wanted to share that, you know, we started working on these issues when we expanded to the states and to cities. And if you think this is hard, the state, there's very little infrastructure to support leadership development for staffers and to support um, intentional diversity programming. And just as, as both ladies have said, it is critically important because it's your pipeline and you get better. I mean, we see a lot of activity now happening in those state legislatures. So um, it's just an, a really important area to, to be cognizant of. And thank you for those wonderful ideas. Um, I'm gonna turn to Madeline. You've, you know, Apex has long been involved in issues of representation um, and champion the diversity across sectors. I would love to hear, given with the pending arrival of a new Congress, um, and all these unknowns in the air, what would be your call to action to folks in the room here as it pertains to, to these issues? Well, I think it's so important for us to remind uh, newly elected and returning electeds that it's important uh, for diversity um, in leadership roles. Um, I know that uh, you know we signed on to the Joint Center's letter um, that's uh, to newly elected and returning electeds to encourage them to look at diverse offices. And I think that's also important for the staff who are in those offices to also amplify that message. Uh, also looking to the leadership of both um, the Republicans and the Democrats to see that they also look at their own staff leadership. Uh, the Joint Center in their October uh, report showcased that there are no Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, or Native Hawaiians in any of the top 20 leadership positions um, in both the House uh, Republicans or Democrats. And so that's incredibly um, uh, telling in the sense that um, there are no Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, or Pacific Islanders in those leadership roles. And so with the new Congress, you're going to want to um, encourage um, these elected officials to think about that. So it's important when, as again, when I say Asian Americans sometimes are, are, are put together um, with uh, the white community that we use that privilege. But at this point, we aren't even there to be able to advocate for that. And so when we are looking for our allies to do that with us, we hope to you know, do that for um, all communities as we stand up together to say it's so important to have a more reflective and representative democracy. Thank you. Uh, we're going to switch up, the, you know, we have about 15 minutes left in the program. I uh, wanted to give both our panelists if uh, the opportunity, if you had any questions for the group. Michelle? I do. You know, we participate in panels like this all the time, and we're, we're asked to share with you some of the things we think have been helpful. But what I have found is that what is often most helpful is turning the question back to you. So we've talked about a number of things tonight. So I am curious if there are things that you are seeing that aren't here, that you want, that you think would be helpful, uh, opportunities, programs, uh, anything. What, 
What are you noticing and what do you think would help change this situation? And it's okay to be creative. Yeah. Yep, here's one, here's a question, great. Yes, come in front and uh, also say your name and where you're uh, from. Sure, uh, Ricardo Sanchez. Uh, I don't work on the Hill. I work for Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, my question is, uh, a lot of the things that you're all talking about don't just happen on the Hill. You see them in the workforce. So a lot of the things that's being spoken really resonates with me. Uh, so something that I've been seeing and something that I've been kind of struggling with is the lack of development within organizations. Uh, here in DC, a lot of uh, a lot of the organizations here in DC are satellite sites, right? Where our main sites are X, Y, and Z states. Uh, so we don't get the same exposure, we don't get the same uh, development opportunities as as our sites do. Uh, so what can can we do? I'm trying to take things into my own hands. I'm, I'm just that kind of person. Maybe my background too in the military, so I'm very used to having these opportunities kind of just baked into your development. So how, what, what can we do at our level to make sure that we are getting that, uh, that, that development even though we're so far from our, from our parent sites? Yeah, it, that is a fantastic question. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> thank you. Thank you for yours. <laughs> um, so I actually do, uh, in my day job, leadership development across different sectors. And I will say, that's why I say all of this is not unique to the federal government, to the state government, to the local government. Humans populate all of these communities, and so we bring all our stuff with us. So when you're a satellite office versus the headquarters or a larger facility, what often happens is those training programs happen on site at the larger uh, facilities. And if they're not willing to bring in people from the other places, then you are kind of stuck. Um, some of the things that I have found to be successful is one asking to um, participate in those programs, helping to co-create those programs, and then also asking them to um, travel it around the offices. And if that's not possible, sometimes one or some of those are possible. Also, if you are given any professional development um, uh, budget for yourself, begin to identify where you can go to do that locally or even not locally. And when, uh, what often happens is that at the, at the higher level, when they start to see the programs, and I tell everybody, if you have a program and it was good, make sure you send that back, that you tell the, you know, the headquarters or whatever the main office is that your satellite kind of reports into. Um, and, and when those things don't work, I think that there are a number of programs uh, we've heard uh, in, in the corporate spaces, or um, you c there are a ton of leadership development programs and organizations, whether it's you know, the American Management Association or it's um, some of the ones that are certification-based. It depends on what you want to do. Um, and then, of course, if it's like a lot of people that don't have any budget for <laughs> professional development, there are always some things you can do online that are, that are uh, low cost or uh, free. And so looking at some of those areas, whether it's some of the, you know, the uh, Coursera's or the um, LinkedIn uh, masterclass, you still have to pay, but there are some of those too. So I think there's, it's multi-tiered. But the biggest thing that I, I invite people to do is try to forge that relationship with the main office and get them to see. Start to show them data. Start to show them information. Because in the corporate space, what they care about is the numbers, right? So if you can show how the numbers tell a story, that that investment makes better sense for the organization, not just you personally, then the better opportunity you have. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for your time and your work. Uh, my name is Mark Gonzalez, and I'm one of the CHCI Public Policy Fellows this year. Uh, sometimes on the Hill, the work can be uh, a little overwhelming, like the workflow. So my question is, what are some recomm recommendations you have to maximize our experience and our time on the Hill for a, a career in public service and beyond? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think what's important when we uh, encourage the APEX uh, participants is that communication is vital when it comes to being able to have conversations with your office about 
priorities for them, priorities for you as what you want out of the, the program. Um, having that conversation to be sure that they understand that um, although you might be working on a portfolio that are, may not be your main interest or have, they might have a few things of interest to you, it's an opportunity for you to, to learn what that uh, other, other um, subject matter. And so when you're talking about these priorities, you're also learning too about um, how you can utilize uh, different types of networking uh, meeting other people who can open more opportunities and networking for you to expand um, your own list of people to contact. Um, and so I always talk about how this is an opportunity really just to meet more people. And when you're doing this, you obviously are putting forth the effort of trying to do your best and learn. Um, and at the same time, you know, learn how to communicate your own needs and expectations to your office. Because ultimately what we want to see in all of this is for you to stay in public service. If you dislike your experience because you feel that you weren't getting something out of it, um, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So being able to better understand um, you know, how your office thinks, how your uh, supervisor you know, wants their, you know, your work product to be delivered, all of those sort of things are transferable skills in a professional workforce because it doesn't matter if you're in a Hill office or corporate office or in a nonprofit. Understanding the workflow and communication to your supervisor is going to make you a successful candidate in any job. And so that communication level first is going to help you better understand um, how to be the best that you can possibly be. Uh, so, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, but also at the same time understand the needs of your, your manager um, and the office goals, because then how does that align with your own? Um, because as you're working together to build a work plan for yourself, it shows that you're putting together um, the initiative to make sure that your office um, is coming first, that you're just right behind that in your own um, needs. Um, and so putting that all together is really building out a work plan, not only for your office, but also for yourself. Hi, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. My name is Katia Mesa. I'm also a CHCI Public Policy Fellow. Um, and I want to go back to the question you asked us on what is something that like we think would be helpful. I think one of the most helpful things for me was most of the senior members in my office uh, are women of color. And that was really helpful for me to have kind of that mentorship right there. But it can be very difficult to find that. Um, and networking events are really helpful, but it's hard to ask like, hey, like I'm looking for a mentor and be very direct about it when you're not fully sure um, how to go about it, or if they are um, looking for a mentee, or if they have the time. So maybe like a mentorship program that would, like would identify people in those positions, or even someone who might just be like a step above you, who would be interested in taking in a mentee who would have similar experiences. Thank you for that. I think it's a great idea. Um, in uh, our house, we are paired, our first years are paired with a more experienced uh, delegate, and so we have a mentor. Um, the challenge is you have to make sure you pair it up with people who actually want that responsibility, but what I will say is that there's nothing wrong with asking, and but be clear on what it is you think you want of the other person. Because there's a difference between mentoring, coaching, and some other things. So some people may think, oh, mentoring just means I have lunch with you once a month. Uh, or mentoring is, I'm going to show you the ropes. And I'm going to tell you, like, this is what you need to look out for. This is how you need to develop yourself. And so I would encourage, uh, yes, I think yes, plus one, what you said. But in the meantime, until one is created, Think about, uh, spend some time thinking about what would a mentor be look like, look like, feel like for you or anybody in this room, and then start to, to pay attention to people that you meet. Start to pay attention to people that you may come across and you may not have met them, but you've seen them do something, and don't be shy to reach out and introduce yourself. I tell people all the time there is, you know, when my son was in high school, it's like do these inter informational interviews. If something, somebody's doing something you admire, you're impressed by, introduce yourself and say, can I just take a few minutes of your time? Can I buy you some coffee? I just want to talk about 
you know, your journey. And, um, and then see um, how to build that relationship until something more formal is available. So. Um, I wanted to add quickly, mentorship is one of those things that we're not very good at in our community. Not because we're not caring people, but because again, some of us are first. We didn't have anybody to learn from. And that was one of the secrets that until you're successful, you don't know that it exists. To that point, I want to emphasize what Michelle suggested, really think about, so the word itself is not important, so asking somebody to be, uh, will you be my mentor, I think it's more of, um, I'm looking for somebody who does X, right? And so really thinking about a conversation, what it would look like, and what you're asking for, because then lo and behold, you have created a relationship. I, mean, I want to stress that all these words like mentoring and, you know, they are part of a system that was created, and I'm going to go a little out there, but it was a system created by not us. They use words, they behave in certain ways, even the values like don't use your hands, don't get so, it's so emotional, all that stuff, we've been trying to fit it in the professional workplace. And some of it doesn't work for us. We do it differently, and we use different words. But the idea is sound. We can't make it on our own. And we need the advice and support and guidance from other people. So really thinking through um, what that conversation, and I really think it's a conversation, not just one question, but a conversation with a person, um, you'll be surprised. I mean, I think a lot of people here, they don't say no. I mean, they see themselves in that person across the way. Um, and you could be delightfully surprised. Thank you, panelists. My name is Alma Molina. I've been a consultant. For oh, for IG, of course, for the gram, always. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hey. I'm Alma Molina. I've been a consultant in DC for longer than a lot of you were in school. Anyway, um, wanted to offer something and also get your thoughts, seeing as how a lot of the interns, fellows have done a lot of their work remotely. And a lot of what have been traditionally networking opportunities in person are no longer available to us in the same way. Wanted to offer how boldly I've had people who have never met me before hit me up on LinkedIn. And much like you were discussing, Nora Lisa, um, they don't look like us to the point where it was so bold that it was off-putting, however, there was still some merit in the fact that they took that risk. Could have definitely used some cultural insight in the finesse, right? But they did that. And certainly gave me enough to like look up who they were and at least send them a resource, right? So how would you offer resources, say if someone's reaching out digitally or if in person isn't as available, especially as more and more people are still remaining hybrid? I often tell people if you're connecting over LinkedIn or even doing a cold email, just a little bit of a research on that person to make sure that there's some commonality. If you look to see who else um, they might know, that you also know a mutual um, relationship. Um, these sort of virtual coffees that have been happening, uh, you know, in the two years that we uh, were uh, working remotely we tried very hard to build environments that um, had um, socialization and, and fun things and, uh, you know, over Zoom or Google Meet or, you know, we would leave, um, you know, the, the room open. We would create a room and, and, and have it uh, just be open for an hour for people to come by and drop by to say hello to the fellows or interns. Um, it's obviously very challenging to build a human connection when you're doing it virtually. And so uh, I think also building environments that allow people to feel like they can do it, it's sort of building that safe space that says, here's a set time that we're doing these sort of coffees you know, over, uh, over Zoom. Um, but also just the, the work it takes too to be able 
to initiate a conversation with someone that you don't know. However, if you do a little bit of homework, um, being able to find that common thread that allows you to say, you know, we have um, a mutual friend or mutual relationship, or I enjoy the work that you're doing that I'm also studying. I think all of that is has been um, a part of some of the ways that we've encouraged um, the Apex fellows and interns to to reach out to people because then at least they have some sense of you know how they can initiate a conversation. And I think also working remotely or even at a place where you don't have as many face to face conversations has challenged some of our community because it's a lot harder to actually go back now to where we are in person that that level of awkwardness just sort of amplifies. Um, and so, you know, I say, you know, practice a little bit, you know, talk to your friends or, you know, pretend that you're, um, you know, trying to s initiate a conversation. Um, and so I think this is, you know, part of it of, of trying to at least get people back into the rhythm um, of actually having in real life conversations itself. Thank you. Um, quickly, to, it's one of the things that you brought up really quick on resources. I want to stress, do your homework, as Madeline says, not just on the person, but also the uh, potential resources that are out there. DC is a very unique place. Again, we don't see this in the States. And DC has a plethora of leadership development. There are institutes. Some are free. Some are not. Some are open to corporate. Um, at the end of this, on the, the, the Instagram feed, we do have some resources that we are sharing. And so if you can get a hold of that, there's some URLs there. Um, there are so many opportunities that, uh, for, for meeting people and enriching your own, uh, you know, your own self. Um, on that note, we, uh, we are approaching the witching hour. And so I wanted to just quickly sign off with four things that we'd like to ask of all of you in this room. And that is you know, our call to action. You've heard a lot of that. And the first is reach out. Reach out, bring people up with you. They were in your situation at one point. Um, also remember that all of us have various identities and feet in different places. Um, it's the, that cooperation between communities is vital. That otherness that we are seeing in the world is against all of us. So it is really, really important that we reach across those communities. Um, reach out to your state networks and to state legislatures. They really, I mean, that is the pipeline. That's going to strengthen, instead of being just one or two or three, that's going to be one or 200. Really, really critical. And then last, um, continue to invest in yourself. It's not just your own personal, professional development and all the career achievement that you gain. You are strengthening our bigger movement to build DEI in state legislatures, in federal government, and in elected office. And if you decide to go into corporate, we need you there too. Because as it was brought up, this, this, this issue exists across industries. So on that note, thank you again for, for letting us join you this evening and, and have, a great, have a great reception. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to Nora Lisa. Thank you to Michelle. Thank you to Madeline for all those insightful comments, uh, all those really great remarks. We really appreciate uh, all the guidance and the resources you've shared. I want to also thank our partners at Representative Democracy for helping to put together this fireside chat. We've hope, we hope you've all found it useful. Um, and tell your friends about the conversation. Uh, the recording will be available online on our social channels. So please be sure to share all those insights. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good night.